Well, good morning, Ritman Grace Brethren Church. How are you folks doing this weekend? It's good to be here with you. My name is Clark, as I always like to say. Um, I am one of the leaders on our staff, and if I haven't had the opportunity to meet you yet, I would love to meet you and your family afterwards, so feel free to stick around. Perhaps when you're uh, heating your car up, you can stick, stick around in the lobby. I'd love to meet you, and if we have met, I'd love to just catch up with you and see how uh, things are going. Uh, I wanted to add a little something to what uh, Dave mentioned in those uh, video announcements. How about that, video announcements? That is, uh, that was very, that was awesome. <laughs> um, he did mention that new series that's going to be coming up here, and I wanted to mention something about some bookmarks that are actually located on that back table. Um, I know many of us who come here on a week-to-week basis are probably familiar where you pick up your bulletins. Uh, next to that, you'll notice a stack of some uh, bookmarks. And I just want to talk a little bit about those for a second. Uh, The bookmark has uh, a week-to-week passage, the passage that we'll be going through on Sunday morning. And on the other side of that uh, bookmark are four questions. And we just want to encourage you to uh, take one of those bookmarks. Um, If you didn't grab one on the way in, maybe grab one on the way out. But we wanted to give you some time between now and when the new series starts, uh, Sunday, March 6th, to maybe find another person where you can uh, get together, possibly at the end of the week, maybe over a cup of coffee, and just talk about uh, the passage for that week, and maybe go through some of those questions. And maybe even, uh, you might have to kind of imagine what that might look like for your situation, your schedule. It could look like a Zoom call, it could look like um, a group text, but maybe find some sort of way where you and one other person Uh, can read that passage every week and go through those questions together. So that's kind of our hope. Uh, One of our values as a church is that when life cuts us, we want to bleed God's Word. Uh, We value its authority. We want to pattern our lives after the Word of God. So we just want to uh, make this an opportunity for you to do just that. So just want to encourage you uh, with that. All right, more to more. uh, On to more and more important stuff here. Let me ask you a serious question. How many of you are rooting for the Bengals by a show of hands. Okay, there's a few. How many by a show of hands are one to, uh, want the Rams to win tonight? Any Ram fans? Okay, there's a couple. Okay. How many people really don't care, just there for the food and commercials? <laughs> All right, there's the majority. At least, at least you're honest. <laughs> well, I'm excited. We're concluding a uh, series we've been in called Wise Up, and it's a six-week study in the book of Proverbs. And basically, we said uh, the goal and the purpose of this study together is we want to ask ourselves uh, this question. What does a life of uh, wisdom look like? What does it look like to live a life that is marked by wisdom? We said, fortunately for us, uh, the Bible actually has a lot to say about the topic of wisdom. Uh, We said, you might think of this book of the Bible as theologically rooted common sense, This is just really good advice on how to live life. Uh, We said this, if you want to live a life that is useful, that is uh, wise, that is honorable, then you're going to want to get real familiar with this book of the Bible called Proverbs. You're going to just want to soak this in as much as you can. So as we've been looking at this book of Proverbs together, uh, we've been looking at different characters that this book kind of lays out for us. And just to recap a little bit, we said there, these four characters in the book of Proverbs uh, consist of this. We had uh, the fool. Uh, one week we looked at that. The next week we looked at the simple or the naive. Uh, we looked at the scoffer. And then last week we looked at the sluggard. So basically we took an extended look at each one of these types of people. But this morning as we conclude our six-week study in Proverbs, we want to talk about how to grow in wisdom. How to cultivate wisdom. And so today I want to give you three ways to cultivate wisdom. Three ways that you can grow in wisdom. So if you're taking notes, uh, you can write this down. Number one is this. Embrace truth. Embrace truth. Uh, Proverbs chapter 8, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. This is the chapter where wisdom is uh, personified as a woman telling us, come and learn from me. This is an invitation. It's a beckoning from God uh, to come and learn wisdom. So let's look at this together, beginning in uh, verse 5 of Proverbs chapter 8. It says this, You who are simple, 
gain prudence. You who are foolish, set your hearts on it. Listen, for I have trustworthy things to say. I open my lips to speak what is right. My mouth speaks what is true. For my lips detest wickedness. All the words of my mouth are just. None of them is crooked or perverse. So the point that Lady Wisdom is getting at here is simple. Wisdom is saying, I am speaking truth. I'm telling you what is true. In other words, in order to become wise, you have to embrace truth. That truth exists. That God is the author of truth. And that we need to live in light of that truth and orient our lives to it. You know, for us to even say that there is a truth in today's society is oftentimes countercultural. We live in a relativistic, pluralistic, postmodern world where any assertion of truth, in other words, if you say that there is such thing as truth, a truth for all people, a truth in all times, a truth in all places, what the cultural elite will tell you is that that is simply a will to power. They would say it's a claim, to claim that something is true is just a way of us getting power. And that's how our culture would oftentimes view a claim to objective truth. But here's the thing, ready? If there is no such thing as truth, then there is no such thing as wisdom. Because wisdom says, this is the way to live. In other words, walk in this way. But how can you say that unless there is a way that is truly wise to walk in? So if there's no such thing as truth, then we might as well just throw out the book of Proverbs. Because there's no, if there's no wise way to walk in, then we could just do whatever we want. So this is a, a challenge for the cultural environment that we live in. But the good news is that it's exactly at this point that relativism is actually self-defeating. Think about it. It's self-refuting. As soon as you say, no one should say that anything is true, that is an assertion of truth. If you say any sentence with the word should in it, that is an assertion of truth. As soon as you say, this is what people ought to do, you're implying some view of truth. So if you say, or if somebody says, no one should force their opinions on anyone else, that is an assertion of truth. So the good news is that truth exists, and there's no way of getting around it. So the first step to wisdom is that we have to embrace truth, that there really is a God, and that truth really is knowable, and that therefore there really is a right way to live. There really is a true and a good way for humanity to function. And that when we live out of line with that, we not only live foolishly, but we live in a way that disregards God's design and God's intention for humanity. In fact, according to the Bible, all of life and all of theology could be summed up as a battle between truth and falsehood. Let me give you a couple examples. In Romans chapter 1, when the Apostle Paul is explaining sin, here's what he says. Romans 1 verse 25. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. So what Paul is saying here, he's talking about what sin is. He says it's, it's exchanging what is true for what is not true. Similarly, Jesus in John chapter 8, when he is talking about Satan, says this. He says, he, meaning the devil, was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So what that means is this. Satan's primary tactic for working against the kingdom of God is not sending demons to live under your bed and jump out of your closet and tackle you. Right? It's not like Linda Blair and the exorcist spinning her head around puking pea soup on you. 
I'm not saying that that doesn't happen, but Satan's primary strategy is just lying. Getting you to believe that things, things that just aren't true so that you can begin living in ways that aren't aligned with what is true. So in order to grow in wisdom, the first thing we have to do is embrace truth. So let me ask you, have you embraced truth? Do you believe that truth exists and what God says is in fact true? And are you willing to conform your life to that? You know, guys, i got to be honest. I think many times we'll agree that God's way is truth. But then we see areas of our lives that are living according to a different reality. It's possible for me to agree with my mouth that something is true and then my life looks totally different. Embracing truth is not just agreeing that something is true, but also bringing my life in a line with that. So that I'm living in line with ultimate reality, what is actually what actually is and with what God says is true. So have you embraced truth? That's the first way to grow and cultivate wisdom and praise embrace truth. Here's the second one. Nurture humility. Nurture humility. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8 and 9 tells us, do not rebuke mockers or they will hate you. Rebuke the wise and they will love you. Instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. The point is this, one of the marks of wisdom is that you're always seeking to grow in wisdom. There's always more for us to learn. That means that we're open to rebuke, open to correction, open to instruction, open to counsel. You seek those things and you desire that if you're wise. Because you know that wisdom is a path. It's not a destination. Wisdom is a path, not a destination. It's not like we arrive and we become this sage where we're sitting on top of a mountaintop and telling everybody else what to do. It doesn't work that way. Instead, wisdom is a path. It's a way in which you walk if you're wise. You're always welcoming more and more wisdom. So in order to grow in wisdom, you have to nurture humility. Being willing to learn Oftentimes, wise people are humble people, and humble people are oftentimes wise people. I think a lot of times, for many of us, we misunderstand what humility is. We oftentimes confuse humility with passivity. We oftentimes buy into the lie that if we're humble, then we're not assertive. But I think it's a mistake to confuse humility with passivity. Because those two things are very different. True humility comes out of a a true assessment of yourself. A deep apprehension of the grace of God. It's knowing who I am and who I'm not. But it's also knowing that everything that I have, everything that I do, all the ways that God has gifted me is from the Lord. And that's the foundation of true humility. Then on the other hand, pride is a high estimation of self in a low estimation of God's grace. Uh, Pride is saying, I I think I'm pretty awesome. God's been pretty gracious, but really, I did a lot to get myself to where I am. That's pride. The way pride tends to manifest itself is in a way that says, I got myself here. How come other people can't do the same? Pride says, I'm a good parent. Why can't other people get their kids under control? Pride says, I have my debt paid off. How come you're a slacker? You can't pay yours off. See, pride is a high opinion of self and a low apprehension of the grace of God. It's saying, I actually think that I did something to get myself to where I am. To cultivate wisdom, we have to do those. First of all, we have to embrace truth. We have to nurture humility. And then thirdly, this should not be a surprise, but we have to say it. We have to worship Jesus. And we talked about this last week, but in Colossians chapter 2, we're given some really helpful insight here. 
as you're turning there, let's just remember that the Bible is one unified story. Uh, we're studying the book of Proverbs not as isolation, but as the primary book in which the Bible deals with wisdom. But if we're really going to understand wisdom, then we have to understand from Genesis to Revelation who Jesus is and what Jesus did. So Colossians chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, connects the dots for us. By the way, this is Paul writing to the church in Colossae. And he says this, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. So notice in verse 3, Paul says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So Proverbs is telling us has been telling us, get wisdom. Pursue wisdom. If it costs you everything that you have, you have to cultivate and pursue wisdom. Get wisdom. Colossians chapter 2, we just read it, it tells us that in Christ are the treasures, the fullness of wisdom and knowledge. And notice that language that he uses there. He says, in whom? In whom? In Jesus, treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. When the Bible uses this phrase here, in whom, especially when Paul, the apostle, uses this phrase to be in Christ, it means something very particular. Think about it this way. There's a really big difference between knowing about Jesus and being in Jesus. You can know the truth about Jesus. You can have good theology about Jesus. You can have lots and lots of data and information about Jesus, but that's very different from being in Jesus, according to the Apostle Paul. When the Bible talks about being in Jesus, to be in Christ, it's talking about the union with Christ that comes as a result of repentance and faith. When you turn away from yourself, from your attempts to save yourself, trying to make God think that you're so great that he has to somehow reward you. When we turn away from that, and when we embrace and trust and hope in Jesus, the Bible says that we are in him. There's this mystical spiritual union between you and Jesus Christ. And the scriptures will speak of this as being born again. We oftentimes will say a... He or she is a born-again Christian. What do we mean when we say somebody is born again? It means that they have a new heart. They have new desires. They have new inclinations. It means that there are things that have changed fundamentally inside of a person because of Christ. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you because there is a union between you and Christ. You are in Christ. So by virtue of His redeeming work in your heart and in your life, Colossians chapter 2 is saying this, unless you're in Christ, you cannot have the fullness of wisdom. That you're not, it's not the same as saying that you can't have any wisdom. It just means that you don't have wisdom and how to use wisdom. You don't know the end in which wisdom exists. Because all wisdom exists for the glory of God and the making known of Jesus Christ. So you may have wisdom, but you may not have the fullness of wisdom. The Bible talks about worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. Worldly wisdom is that that's used for self-exalting, self-promotion, self-worshipping sort of ways. And it's ultimately about me and my agenda and what I want out of life. For example, it is possible, it's very, very possible uh, to be wise in how to make money and for that to be entirely selfish. So if I make a lot of money for my own exaltation and my own comfort, and I put that to work so that I can enjoy everything that I want to enjoy, but I never put that money for the glory of God and for the good of humanity, 
so that Jesus might be known and so that Jesus might be exalted. I can have wisdom in making money. I'm just not wise in what to do with that wisdom. I'm not using it rightly. I see, you know, when you come to know Jesus, that's what changes. It's not like when you come to know Jesus that you figure out how to make a bunch of money overnight. That's what the guys on TV will tell you, but that's not true. It's not like all of a sudden you get all this wisdom that you never had before. But the chances are, if you're good at making money, if you're good at investing money now, then after coming to know Jesus, you'll still be a wise investor. But here's what changes. All of that now becomes about the glory of God, the worship of Jesus Christ. That's the switch that takes place. So now you're delivered from self-worship, and you're delivered into the worship of Jesus, and everything starts to look different. So Jesus, let's talk about Jesus now. He was the wisest person who ever lived. But Jesus used his wisdom not for himself, not to exalt himself, not to further his own agenda, but rather to lay down his life for foolish, scoffing, ignorant friends. That includes you and me. He used his wisdom for redemptive purposes. In the same way, when we come to worship Jesus, when that thing flips in us, we realize that it's all about Jesus. It's all about his glory. It's all about worshiping him. All of life now becomes about how do I worship Jesus with what he has given me? How do I begin to exalt Jesus and praise Jesus and worship Jesus and make sure that he is honored and glorified in everything that I have in life? So how does this actually look? Let me give you two categories that we've actually uh, covered already. Uh, Take truth and humility. When we worship Jesus, we are free to embrace truth without becoming judgmental, critical, and superior in the holding of that truth. Many times when you have truth, it's easy to think you're superior intellectually or culturally to people who don't believe the same thing. You tend to look down on them to be critical of them because that's the natural bent of the human heart. Christians who really get the gospel, though, who really understand what it means to know the grace of God in Jesus Christ, that gets broken out of them. And it looks like being relentless about truth. They have a high and strong view of truth, just like the Bible does. And yet they're very charitable and gracious about how they hold that. It's normal for Christians who believe and embrace the gospel to say things like, yes, I do believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. Just like Sam read earlier, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. But it's possible to have a strong belief and and grasp of that truth and to also have friendships with people who believe all kinds of other things. Different worldviews, different religious systems, those who don't believe in any religion, Christians who are really gripped by the gospel can hold both of those together. Because it's not about me and my need to justify the truth that I have and make sure that you know that you're wrong. It's about God and his glory because I love God, I love his truth. And because I love God, I can love you. And that's how those things go together. But it's only when you get the gospel that you're freed from self-worship so that he is what is most important to you. When we worship Jesus, we're free to cultivate actual humility instead of just pretend humility. We all know that we're supposed to appear humble. Everybody knows that we're supposed to appear humble even if we're not. But for many of us, we just pretend to be humble. We know how to look it on the outside. But Christians who have really been changed by the gospel, there's a true and profound humility that looks different from attempts to be humble or to look humble. For people who really get the gospel, what I actually believe is that my sin was so bad that Jesus had to die for it. 
Isn't that crazy to even think about? So if you really believe that my sin is so bad that the Son of God had to bleed and die on a bloody Roman cross for my sin, then how can I possibly look down on you? How can I possibly develop pride and selfishness and think, man, I kind of have it together. One day you'll be as good as I am. There's no way for me to think that if I really believe that my sin is so bad that Jesus had to die for it. You see, what you need is the same thing that I need, and that's Jesus Christ. That nurtures a true and real and a deep humility. It's not just a pretend humility. It's not just an external humility, but it's a true humility because of the grace of God. When we worship Jesus, we become truly wise in a way that points to Jesus. It points to God. It points to his glory. So our wisdom becomes not how do we do the best in life that we can or how do we enjoy the best relationships that we can have. Instead, our pursuit of wisdom becomes about how do we become a people who exalt Jesus. And this is what gives the gospel a tangible expression. We're called to be a people who don't simply just profess the gospel, but we also display the gospel. And part of our mission statement here at Ribbon Grace is that we want to be examples of the love of Jesus to all. And that's what points people to Jesus. We don't point people to Jesus simply by conforming to the culture so that we believe what everybody tells us to believe. And we also don't point people to Jesus by becoming religious so that we draw boundaries around ourselves and say, we're awesome and everybody else is dumb. Come be like us. Why? Because that doesn't glorify God or honor Jesus. But what does glorify God and honor Jesus is when we cultivate wisdom, when we grow in wisdom so that we begin to live a life that points to Jesus, that displays Jesus and says the only explanation of the way that we are as a people is Jesus. Only the grace of God can do this. So let me ask you, are you worshiping Jesus? Do you long to be wise so that he can be greatly glorified in your life? Do you want to be wise? Do you want to have wisdom? Do you want to grow in wisdom so that Jesus can be shown to be great in your life? In order to grow in wisdom, you have to embrace truth, you have to nurture humility, and you have to worship Jesus. I want to invite the band back up here, and as they're getting settled in, uh, let me just close with uh, some final thoughts here as we uh, conclude this six-week study in Proverbs. Guys, the reason that we've spent time in the book of Proverbs during this winter season is because I want us to be wise. And I think God wants us to be wise. The book of Proverbs calls us and beckons us, and it says, would you come and learn? If you're immature, would you come and learn wisdom? That's what God wants for us. That's what God wants for you. That's what God wants for me. He wants us to be a people who are in our very existence, that the way that we do life points to the existence and the supremacy of God. So would you embrace truth this morning? Would you nurture humility? And would you worship Jesus? Let's pray together. Lord, we just want to acknowledge your presence this morning. And God, we just want to recognize that all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. Lord, we confess and we ask you to forgive us for times where we have ignored godly wisdom and have instead embraced worldly wisdom. Where we would are tempted to think that somehow we can come to know the way things work by our own human striving or by relying on the so-called truth of this world, this culture. But Lord, we, we thank you for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
we thank you that as a byproduct of the gospel, Lord, not only do we have salvation through faith and repentance in your son Jesus and his death on the cross, but we also have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and we are pointed to the source of wisdom, the ultimate way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to see that wisdom will ultimately point us to Jesus. Lord, I pray for anyone here this morning who is trying to navigate that decision. Lord, I pray for anybody who is tempted to think that you know, maybe the culture has what I really need. Uh, maybe, maybe Jesus isn't the way. Maybe Jesus isn't the truth. Lord, I pray that folks would come alongside of them and that you would speak through your word to them and that you would help folks to, to make that decision to give their lives fully to you. As your word says, you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. No one comes to the Father but through you, Jesus. Pray this in your name. Amen.